dimer models or perfect matching on regular bipartite planar graphs. Uh, it is essentially three different names, more mathematical or more physical for the same uh, notion, and we'll explain this later. And uh, the fact is that when you have dependence on boundary condition, you are actually um, breaking translation and invariance because the boundary breaks the translation invariance. And uh, then bulk thermodynamic quantities can acquire dependence from the point in space where you are, spatial dependence. So you can have a special dependent order parameters, special dependent energy density, etc. And also what can appear, what can occur is that you can have a phase separation in space. So you have a, induced by the boundary condition, the emergence of different phase in your domain, uh, with, uh, which are usually separated by a smooth curve, but uh, the separation between the phase is sharp. And this curve is called Arctic curve, for instance. <clears throat> As I said, uh, the, the canonical example is Daimler models. And um, what we call phase separation in physics is actually uh, called by mathematicians the limit chain phenomenon. And we shall see there are just two, two slightly different point of view. Uh, what is this limit chain phenomenon is that uh, you can associate to some statistical model an height function and this height function, so you have a two dimensional model, you associate to it, for instance, to the side of this lattice model, a height function which uh, describes a stepped two dimensional surface embedded in three dimensional space. And it appears that in a continuous thermodynamic limit, what is called the scaling limit, uh, this tends to sum definite smooth curve and uh, well this is what is called the limit chain phenomena but now let us start to be a little bit more definite so we shall consider a square, square lattice and we consider the tiling of the lattice by dominoes Dominoes are just tiles, which are of dimension two by one. Of course, they can be horizontal or vertical. And uh, uh, you want to cover a region, a region of your domain of your lattice. In this case, I have chosen the square lattice. Uh, without having any overlap with, uh, between tiles and with no holes left. So it is a complete covering. Of course, you can also consider the dual lattice so that the dual lattice is again a square lattice. In this case, you associate the vertex to the face and vice versa. And on the dual lattice, you can consider the covering of edges with dimers. So a dimer is a something which cover an edge and the two adjacent vertex and then you want to cover your again your square lattice in such a way that each vertex is covered by one and only one lattice okay of course the dual picture in the sense of the dual lattice of this is this where here you can put dominoes in such a, in this way for instance okay you can also, when you have this formulation, you can imagine to have a more general situation. This is a tetravalent regular graph, but you can consider a more general graph. If the graph is bipartite, you can study its coverings. Um, I just show you an example. Excuse me. Uh, yes. Maybe I have a question or a remark. It's possible, uh, can you hear me? Yes. It's possible to consider the same problem even if the graph is not bipartite. Yes, of course it's possible, but uh, we shall restrict to bipartite graphs. It's the problem uh, is that when you have non-bipartite graphs, you have uh, a lot of additional complications. Like, for example? Well, uh, you know, uh, it, it depends on the boundary. It could be that it is not, co it's not, 
that it's not possible to find a, a solution for your tiling. Even in bipartite graph, huh? you okay. know, there is this famous example of the chessboard. You consider a chessboard where you cut off two white square, then you can see that it is not possible to cover it with dominoes. So even on the bipartite graph, you have to make some assumption. And on the non bipartite, you have additional complication. Thank you. Uh, well, it was clear, hopefully. Anyway, so let uh, what we. I want to show you a picture just to make clear what we are considering. So, on the left, on the left, can you see the picture? I mean, okay. yes, yes. So on the left, uh, what you see is just a chessboard, an eight by eight uh, square lattice. And then I have put some dimers or dominoes on it. And uh, as you see, there are four colors. Why four colors? Because you can have uh, horizontal or vertical dominoes. But among horizontal dominoes, you have an additional uh, distinction. You can have the left square, the left part of the domino on a black square or on a white square. And vice versa, and similarly for the horizontal, so for the vertical dominoes. So in all, you have four colors, and the typical tiling is uh, this on the right. The typical tiling of a this is a square of side forty, and you have three boundary condition in the sense that uh, uh, you see you, but there is no additional condition. I would like to see that to say that the number of tilings is enormous. In this case, for instance, if you count, we shall uh, count this in, uh, in 20 minutes. If you count the number of tilings for this square of different configuration, you see that it is bigger th than the number of protons in the universe, assuming that the number of protons is around 10 to 80. So now we can we switch back, sorry. We switch back to the blackboard. And uh, the first question we consider therefore, let's consider therefore our rectangle, which is a rectangular region of our square lattice. And we want to ask how many covering are there? The rectangular size L by M. So in some sense, what we are computing is a partition function, sum of over all possible tilings of ones. You just put a one for each possible configuration for each possible tiling. So the first question is how many, what is Z? How many tilings are there for the M by L lattice? So exercise. Let us consider the case M equal to. So the, we are considering the L by two lattice. So this is homework, easy homework. Please compute the number of uh, tiling. More in general, more generally, the formula is quite complicated. I will write it. Number of configuration for the L by M rectangle is given So this formula is a quite peculiar. For instance, it's not at all obvious that this will give you an integral number, as it should. Uh, Moreover, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Jérôme. Um, uh, 
so what is in front of the cosine? It, it's Sorry? hard to read. Uh, what is in front of the second cosine? Is it the 2i? It's, it's, sorry, it is pi k. Yes, I will try to write bigger. And, yeah. and in front of the cosine, of this cosine? Pi k over m plus 1. Uh, so it's 2i. 2i, I see. Okay. Sine. Then I'll find this way of uh, writing this formula. Okay. So okay. I think this is the most transparent. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So it's two cosine and then plus two i and other cosine. And you have j over l plus one and k over m plus one. Okay. And uh, another thing which is a little easier to see is that as soon as one of the two, uh, uh, as soon as the number of squares is odd, that is, if both l and m are odd, then you, you all this problem makes zero because one of the factors vanish. Okay, so this formula has been proven by Castellani in 61 and also by Temperley and Fisher in 61 independently. And uh, there are several ways to, to prove it, and we shall sketch here the proof. So, uh, so let us write the first step. The first step is that ZLM can be written as the determinant of some matrix K, absolute value, and square root, where K, K is the Z, uh, uh, Adjacency matrix, that is k is equal. One is i and j are connected by some edge. In the graph picture, and zero otherwise. With a caveat, this is a standard adjacent. Adjac let us call adjacency matrix, but we consider a weighted adjacency matrix where we put an additional i, we are in the square lattice in this case, an additional i every time the edge is vertical and uh, you leave it at, at, as one when it is horizontal. Well, where i is again the imaginary unit. Okay, so actually this, uh, I wrote it as a DLM, but uh, this formula uh, uh, works for any, any planar bipartite graph. I have not defined it bipartite. Bipartite means that uh, uh, for each vertex, uh, you can uh, color all the vertex of the system, of the lattice, of the graph, in such a way that uh, if uh, one vertex is, is white, the adjacent vertex are black and vice versa. This is obvious, for, this is easily done for the square lattice, but for instance, you can see that it is not possible to do this for the triangular lattice. Okay, so let us explain uh, how this works. Hello? There is a question. Professor? Sorry? Hello? Um, I got a question. So, like, um, you're saying edge is the edge of the dominoes or edge of the lattice itself? Or just like on, for example, L and M on the data edge of that or the edge of the domino? Sorry, but I hear you very badly. Oh, shit. Uh, I'll type it. I was not able to understand. Okay, well. Uh, uh, okay, uh, I can I repeat the question. So the, the question is, uh, is it the edge of a, of a domino? Or is it the edge of the manifold? I'm not sure which oh, manifold. So it is the edge, uh, if you associate to the square lattice of the domino, the square of the dual, the dual lattice, which is the corresponding graph with the covering with diamonds, then this is a centimetric of the graph. So it's Where? just an edge of the lattice. Yes, there is uh, actually the, the, the proof, uh, the theorem and the proof are for graph, even non, non necessarily uh, square lattice, that is a, a tetravalent regular graph, but it's more general, okay? 
<coughs> so uh, how the proof goes? The proof goes, uh, well, I will only sketch it, but uh, the point is the following. Let us introduce, I will uh, work out in detail a small example. We consider the case M equal two and uh, L equal three. And uh, we put, here we have a problem, what I call white and what I call black on a blackboard. This is an unsolvable problem in Daimler models. But, uh, so this is black and this is white. So I will uh, enumerate the black with odd numbers and the white with, sorry, not, uh, not exactly. I will enumerate the black vertex first and the white second. And then I put a matrix which is B adjacency matrix, which is only a matrix where you put uh, the white vertex on, on one direction and the black vertex on the other one. It is clear that uh, here you have uh, the vertex one is, really, is connected to four and five. So here in one you pack. Sorry, I, I have made some mistake here. One, two, three, four, five, six. I have made a stupid mistake. Here I have four, five, six. So vertex one is uh, related, is connected to vertex four and five. So here you put one. Vertex five is connected to one, two, three. So vertex five is connected to one, two, three, etc. You fill this and in general you obtain this. Then we have, uh, suppose we want to compute the determinant of this. The determinant in the case n by n, suppose we have a two n lattice, in the case n by n, the determinant would be something like sum over sigma over permutation. where for a twin lattice here you have n minus one to the parity of sigma. And then you would have a product one sigma one, a n sigma n. Mm, sorry, in your matrix, uh, the last column, is it correct that there's a zero? In no, you're right, because... thank you for correcting. Okay. Yes. So this is just a determinant of such matrix, which I have called A. And it is clear that, forget about the sign, it is clear in this product that you pick for each column, one entry for each column and one for each row, and you make the product. And every time you have a possible edge, a possible covering with no overlap on the graph, then you will have one. As soon as you don't satisfy the condition, as soon as the choice of the entries does not correspond to any dimer covering, then you will have at least one zero and this will make zero. So if you are uh, without this minus one, this would be a permanent and this would exactly count the, the, um, the possible coverings, which is the formula we are looking for. Unfortunately, we, are, we have this one, minus one to the sigma, but you can see that each time you exchange two columns or two rows, it corresponds to column and two rows, which are taken in, in one of the, you consider a term which has a corresponding choice of column and rows, and then you just consider the permutation where you have, have exchanged two columns. Then you can see that this correspond to exchanging, for instance, this diamond configuration with this one. on your square lattice. So, so you, every time you make this exchange, you will get a minus one here that you don't want. And the trick is to add a minus one here. And how do you, you do this? You just put a minus one, for instance, for the vertical dominoes with respect to the plus one of the horizontal. So you do what I have written there. You associate an imaginary unit to each vertical edge. In other words, here, the vertical edge are one, four, 
five, two, three, six. So the matrix, you introduce some matrix A tilde, which is a B adjacency matrix, and which is in, sorry, I should write it here, which is in this particular case is a, with three imaginary units on the diagonal. Okay. So when you have done this, what you have is that the determinant of the matrix A gives you exactly the number of tiling. It is the number you are looking for. Actually, it is more convenient to work with, not with a B adjacency matrix, but with a adjacency matrix. And the trick, it just to build a bigger matrix. Where you put not only the white vertex on the rows and the black on the column or vice versa, but you put all vertex and the corresponding adjacency matrix. So it will be some A tilde here and some A tilde transpose here. And here we'll have zero. Okay. So if you compute the determinant of this, this corresponds to taking the square of this determinant. And so you have to take the square root and this explain the, this formula one. Okay. So the next question is how to compute the determinant. How to compute the determinant? The trick is to diagonalize it and to find the eigenvector and eigenvalues. So this is very easy as well, in fact. Let us This matrix can be re rewritten with some thinking. You can see that the matrix K defined here can be rewritten in general as some, you can separate in the case of the square lattice, you can separate uh, the, um, decouple the horizontal edge and the vertical one. And so you can write your emergency matrix <coughs> in this way, where big I is the identity, and this is just a tensor product. Okay? You have to think uh, one minute and you see that this is obvious, where BL or BM is simply a, a three diagonal matrix with zero on the diagonal and uh, one next to the diagonal and all the remaining entries are zeros. Okay, so it, it is uh, just a question of thinking in one minute to see that K can indeed be written in this way because uh, your graph can be viewed as a kind of tensor product between all the horizontal lines and between all uh, and uh, the vertical lines. Then you have just, so the eigenvalues of K will be just given by the eigenvalues of B of this object time plus the eigenvalues of this. So you have to compute these eigenvalues and these eigenvectors. This is an exercise that you have already done, I am sure, uh, as undergraduate. But if you don't know, then you are urged to do this. And you will see that, for instance, for BL, which is L by L matrix,
the eigenvectors are given by this expression, J numbers the first, second, else eigenvectors, and the corresponding eigenvalues is just uh, where again J equal one L labels the L different eigenvalues. Okay, or you find this formula, you just uh, do Fourier transform, Fourier, Fourier series. It's plain wave, let us say. This is the first neighbor interaction. So when you have found the eigenvalues, you have to sum them. You have some i here, which is that i, and this is a form. So if there are questions, please ask. Well, maybe I, I can start to... Um... Okay, so these look very much like the, the like the eigenvalues of the discrete Laplacian. Uh, so yes. is there is there a is there how how can we see that there is a connection? Sorry, well, this is essentially this is looks uh, like a, if you know this is a kind of first neighbor interaction. Thinking. On the identity, on the, no, no, on, the on the diagonal, yes, on the diagonal, yes, but yes. There is a sign different. Uh, well, I have not thought about this. I have not thought. I will think. I will think, and uh, may, maybe somebody knows the answer in the audience. I will think about this. Uh, maybe for this afternoon. Okay. Um, uh, maybe we should, should just uh, wait a few seconds, see if there are other questions. So, uh, other questions? Okay, no. So, let's, no, it's uh, fine. Let's I, let us let us go on. Thank you. Yeah, thank so, you. Sorry, excuse uh, me, maybe. Ah, there is a question. Maybe. Uh, Audio is very bad for me. Uh, can you hear me? Louder. Please. Can you can you hear me? Yes. yes now yes. Okay. Um, maybe the connection with the the Laplacian is because this problem can be solved using uh, fermionic techniques. I think. Uh, ah yes, of course. Possible of course. to write uh, the partition function uh, as a part integral as an integral uh, over uh, Grassmann variables and. Yes, I was to, uh, I was going to say this. Maybe it's because of this. Mm -hmm. uh, thank mm -hmm. you for the comment. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, uh, this could be the relation. What I wanted to say is that this formula uh, is it's not really a Fafian because for, the Fafian is defined for anti-symmetric metric, so you should need some minus. But you can play further with these uh, Castellan tricks. You can introduce some Castellan orientation, and you can re-express, actually, this uh, partition function as some Fafian, that is the determinant of some matrix. Let us say, I don't know. It's not really appropriate name. You know, you can define uh, a function of, uh, of R in this way. Sorry, of, uh, of this big matrix. Huh? As, as, I'm, I'm sorry, I made it, I work it around. What I wanted to say is that you can write function of this matrix as uh, that of R. 
Okay, so if you play a little bit with the weights you can, and you use uh, some additional trick, you can express this as a Pfaffian. Actually, the Pfaffian come out of the box automatically, automatically if you reformulate this in terms of a path integral with Grassmann variables. And this is due to the relation of dimers with free fermions. And uh, yes, uh, uh, as was just suggested, this is probably the reason of, uh, of this connection with the Laplacian. Also, it's, it was it's slightly different. Uh, on the same line, uh, you can again uh, prove it on uh, with Fafian, for instance, it is explained on the book by Itkinson and Ruff. You can ask for the correlation. What is the probability of obtaining, of observing a certain configuration of dimers, where this is just that I have, a, I am considering dimers on the site W, white one and black one, white and n, small n dimers. And I am asking, what is the probability of having a tiny linguist position of dimers as, as these positions, uh, as specified here? And this, again, can be written as a determinant of Castellan matrix power minus one, where you take the minor. You invert the Castellan matrix to take the minor associated to these labels. And so what you have actually is just a very small determinant. It is a determinant of size, small n, instead of uh, being uh, the size of the, of the number of vertex of the graph. So this is the, uh, a theorem by Kenyon for mathematicians in 20 years ago. But for physicists, actually, it was known probably much earlier Thank you. Thanks to these Grassmann variable techniques. Okay. So the next question is to ask for the thermodynamics. You want to ask uh, when L and M go, uh, becomes very large. You can introduce the free energy density per site. And uh, actually, the limit. With L, the ratio between pixel, which will be the aspect ratio of your rectangle. So the result is that F, where C is Catalan constant. Um, exercise, please prove this formula. The previous exercise was, was quite easy. This is a little bit more difficult. It needs some calculation. It's not very difficult, but uh, uh, so it requires some work. Maybe just to make the exercise well defined, uh, you should uh, you should define <coughs> C. Right? You should uh, say, say, give a formula for C. Uh, Ah, yes, yes, you're right. Well, there are many, but one is a nice, well, the one which is useful in this case is, uh, if I am correct. Let me check. Yes. Well, uh, you, you imagine the sequence. You can uh, guess what is the generic term. Minus one over three square plus one over five square, etc. Okay. okay, so 
let us uh, see what is this a little bit what is this number so this says that This is just saying that the number of tilings grows as you just replace number, you obtain okay, and this. Uh, you see that already for L equal 40, this is 600. Uh, sorry, it's uh, more, it's uh, 1600. And so this is at already 200, 10 to the 200, which is more, much more than the evaluated number of protons in the universe. Well, I could go on five more minutes or should I stop? Okay, so uh, now we shall consider a slightly different system. Let us consider a different region. We all, we still, co we come back with domino. From now on, we will stick to dominoes. So, um, instead of considering a square region of the square lattice, we consider a, a tilted square region, which is called Aztec diamond, which is here in the picture, you can see an Aztec diamond of order N, of order four, sorry. So the order of the diamond is the number of rows, uh, is half the number of total rows of the, of the region. So one could ask, uh, but why to consider this? Well, uh, you will see why, but uh, first let us consider the first question to ask is uh, what is the number of, of, uh, of tilings of this domino? This is a negative size in combinatorics. Well, more than an exercise, it's not completely trivial, actually. So, uh, Zach Zach Diamond, which I will abbreviate with A. Uh, sorry, we still see your slides. We don't see ah, the sorry, sorry, thank you. Thank you, Jerome. So, yes, I will uh, denote a, a by AD the Aztec diamond and uh, AD of order N, that is with two N rows. It's just, if you speak in, uh, in terms of, uh, of dominoes, it's just given by the plaquette whose center satisfy the set of plaquettes whose center satisfy the coordinate of the center satisfy of course the condition of being half integer but the condition of being within this tilted square And you can see that in this case, the number of sites is 2n square. This is important when you will have to normalize the free energy to compare. So, uh, I'm sorry, not a question. Uh, is that on? Uh, there is a question. Yes. Hello? Um, is that Z1 or Z? Sorry, this is Z. Z is a set of integral numbers. Oh, OK. I thought it was, sorry. Yes, no problem. It's uh, so 
The partition function, or if you want, the number of tiling for the diamond of order n is given by this very simple formula. Exit science derives this result. Well, uh, I don't think you will be able, but you can go on Wikipedia. And on Wikipedia, there is a relatively simple derivation based on the fact that you can map the problem onto a problem of non-intersecting lattice path. And then there is a standard theorem by gesell Vieno, which give you, which help you to compute this. Um, so you can compute again the free energy. As usual, you have to make the limit, divide by the number of sites, the partition function. And uh, what you have is, of course, this. So what you see is that the free energy per site, which was, I, which was here something like 0 0.3, 0 0.29, is here 0 0.17, which is much smaller. So you see? Log, sorry. Yes. You see that the um, the free energy and the number of tiling is much sm smaller for this lattice. The free energy per site. Okay. And um, as you will see, this is related to the fact that the, a lot of configuration are constrained by the boundary, by this new boundary. I will show you a picture now. So if you, the question is, let us consider one of these billions of possible dominoes. Let us look at a typical one. We can uh, take a uh, hundred of them and typically you will see something like this. So if you have never seen this, this is a bit striking. What you see is that uh, four kind of frozen region with no disorder, completely ordered region appears in the four corners while in the center, you have a disordered behavior, which is more what you expect uh, when you think to the, the usual rectangle, for instance. So you see the emergence of phase separation induced by the boundaries. And you can ask what happens if you go towards the scaling limits. In numerics, what you see is that the boundary between ordered and disordered region becomes sharper and sharper. And uh, Actually, then one can ask, uh, for instance, what is the shape of this, uh, of this circle? This is a, a first example with a, a small abuse of language. This is the first example of a limit shape, something which appears in statistical mechanics, uh, which has a definite limit. And indeed, uh, this was mathematically proven that the interface between ordered and disordered region in this case is exactly a circle. Sorry. So uh, I think this is a good point to stop. Huh? And uh, so let us meet again. Well, no, there is time for questions. So please ask <coughs> questions if you have. I come back to the... So sorry, can I ask? Yes, yeah, sure. Sure. So is this a property of, uh, you know, every single uh, arrangement or just a kind of thermodynamic property? Sorry, uh, I didn't understand the question. So, so these sorts of shapes, do they appear for every single tiling kind of in the thermodynamic limit or is it just the thermodynamic limit that, uh, you know, on average they look like this? Uh, I will repeat, I understood the question. You are, you are asking if only in the thermodynamic limit you see the circle? No, I mean, the question... The question is whether this is a statistical property or if it's a, or if it's, or if this constraint that the corners are frozen holds for uh, all configurations. No, 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 no. Yeah, a good question, yes. So, let us consider the usual rectangle. Well, where, what could I? 
Let us consider the usual rectangle. Uh, I am erasing the formula about the free energy of dominoes, but uh, I want to recall you that it was, it was smaller because a lot of configuration are, are forbidden, statistically forbidden, but not completely forbidden. Uh, let us consider usual square. Of course, you have a, a, one among all configuration, you have one which is completely ordered, okay? But then you have 10 to the 100, which are of every kind. You have only one which is completely ordered, so it is a kind of entropical situation. You, uh, from the point of view of entropy, the order of the region do not count anything. In the case of the Adzec diamond, I will draw. Uh, I will drop just one corner to, to make you understand. Of course, here you could put an horizontal domino, and there is a configuration with, as you, as you can see from the picture, as you are seen from the picture here. Typically, you had an array of you had an array of vertical dominoes in in the left corner in this way. Okay, but of course, this is only one configuration or a, a small number of configuration. So this is the dominating configuration. Of course, you could also put vertical dominoes here, but then you are constrained to put a ver sorry, horizontal dominoes. You are constrained to put an horizontal domino also here, also here, etc. You see? And here you have again, you can again put whatever you like, but you already see that having one horizontal domino here with respect to having one vertical one is uh, very strongly limited due to entropical consideration. So in a typical configuration, you will have rather this kind of configuration in the corner. Because when you iterate this procedure, you see that you see that uh, you are constraining too much. I yes, hope so, I answered the question. Yeah, I, I think so. And uh, okay, so in the meantime, we had some comments in the chat. So let me uh, read some of them. Uh, so I think this happens for typical tilings. Is that correct? So I yes, it's typical tiling. You said. you take. Uh, of course, if you are very very unlucky, there are a few tilings which are of this kind in the corner, but they are very very few. Yes. So yes. in statistical mechanics, you don't see them, especially in the scaling limit. And uh, exactly. And then an another comment, I think typical means the set of configuration that are not typical has null measure in the thermodynamic limit. Exactly. Uh, yes, you can say at this uh, in this way. Uh, we, I will comment on this. It is a theorem. I will comment on this uh, on the next lecture. I'm kind of curious, like, on how to get, actually get that picture. On um, how do you simulate it in a computer? In that case, like, um, is there any specific, like, interesting tricks that you're doing, or uh, no? Sorry, I understand nothing. Could you speak it slowly? Yeah, the question is, uh, how did you how did you produce these uh, pictures? What what kind of algorithm do you use to produce the pictures well, of the there, Arctic Circle? There are uh, many algorithms. Uh, if you go around, uh, you will see a lot of simulation by different people with with, with different algorithms. But uh, the one I used for the high definition picture is called coupling from the past. It is a kind of rigorous Monte Carlo developed by mathematicians. In the sense that in Monte Carlo, at some time you have to stop and you don't know what, it is difficult to evaluate as an uncertainty on your simulation. Here again, instead you have a, a, a problem, a, the, the algorithm iterates until it stabilizes to a typical solution. So, of course, you don't know how much time you will have to wait. This is uh, the minus of the algorithm. But the plus is that uh, you have no error. You have surely a true uh, random sample, completely with an unbiased random sample from your probability distribution, from your Gibbs distribution. Ah, sorry. So it is coupling, what I use is coupling from the past. The algorithm was developed by Ben Wieland, but uh, for the particular case of, uh, 
something from, no, I am wrong. For the six matrix model, it was developed by Ben Willen, but uh, more generally, the general algorithm was developed by Prop and Wilson. But if you go, I mean, I can give you some reference. For instance, uh, Jacopo Vitti, which is organizer, produced uh, one or two papers where he made simulation with standard Monte Carlo. Then there is also some paper by Cugliandolo and Gonella. Well, I will show you some simulation. We choose completely different kind of mean field uh, pay, piles approximation to, there are many ways to simulate this. Uh, okay, so we have another question in the chat, but uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. So I will just read it. Uh, so the so the algorithm is under an, an ansatz, uh, but I, I don't un understand the question. Can you maybe ah you say now we have to pass the question? Okay, sorry. So ca question cancelled. Okay. Okay. Uh, are there other questions? I have a curiosity, Filippo, sorry, I'm Jacopo. Yes, please. Can you hear me? So, okay, so you presented these two examples where you can calculate essentially the partition function for this uh, coverings on, on, um, on, a, on a square lattice and okay, the Aztec diamond. But uh, the theory is general, I suppose, but you have other examples when, where you can calculate exactly the eigenvalues of this uh, Sorry, I, I, I mean, didn't uh, understand the last part of the question, of the comment. There are other ex examples of exact calculation of such partition functions for other lattices. Uh, yes, for the triangular lattice, uh, there are, sorry, for the honeycomb lattice. The, uh, well, dimers on honeycomb or uh, Lausanne styling of triangular lattice, which is the same, the dual picture. Uh, there are a lot of exact results in that case. Actually, it's simpler. It's slightly simpler. I will give some, I will explain a little bit maybe soon. Thank you. Maybe we should stop and make 10 minutes break. Okay. So okay, we'll you thank you very much. 10 minutes, yeah. Uh, what's this, in arms? Okay, so let us start again. Uh, Jérôme, may I start? Uh, sure, sure. Okay, so let us start. Yes, uh, I was told that there is a question about uh, if such kind of phase separation has been ever observed, ever observed in some experimental system. As far as, as I know, no. But I think there is some related problem, related physical system, which is this kind of spin eyes and maybe he, they are trying to do something. The problem is, you know, is, is how to implement boundary condition of such kind uh, at the microscopical level. But I must say that I am, maybe somebody else knows more than me. Okay. No. No, um, is there is another question about bulk edge correspondence. No, but uh, as we shall see, yes, uh, uh, but not. Uh, it's not a deep correspondence. It's just some kind of analogy. We shall see later. Okay, so I I show you the, once again the picture of the Arctic Circle. And uh, I want just to comment, yes, that uh, the convergence of the boundary of the disordered region to a circle is in probability. So this comes uh, towards the question that was at the end of the last, of the last hour uh, about the fact that, yes, it is a question that the configuration which do not respect this phase separation are in a incredibly exponentially small number when you go in the thermodynamic limit. And indeed, the fact that this tends to a circle is a theorem. It's a theorem by Jokush, Prop, and Shor. This is Peter Shor of. Uh, sorry, uh, we see we still see your slides again. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Jerome. No. Thank you so much. So this is a theorem 
uh, by Jokus Propel Show, Show is one of the Shore algorithm, and uh, the theorem says that uh, uh, for any chosen epsilon, a positive epsilon, there is some n such that if you take a randomly picked tiling, the frozen boundary, that is the boundary of the disordered region, stays almost always in probability, almost always in probability, within distance epsilon of the circle which is inscribed in this, in the square, in the Isaac diamond. And it stay within distance epsilon from the circle with probability one minus epsilon, okay? So as, n, as you choose smaller and smaller epsilon, you are guaranteed that at some n, you will have this condition satisfied. So this is a good point to, study, to consider the scaling limit. The scaling limit is just that you send this n to infinity. At the same time, you send the mesh of the lattice to zero in such a way that the product mesh of the lattice times number of sites stays of order one. For instance, exactly one, if you like. And uh, so you have, a, it is a thermodynamical continuous limit and it is in this limit that you have the limit shape. So what we shall discuss now is the uh, height mapping. Just to give you some intuition, let us consider um, the triangular lattice. instead of the square lattice. And let us consider, sorry, this, this chalk is not very good. I should have prepared the picture. So this is a triangular lattice and you can cover it with tiles. You can see that you, the tiles are uh, rhombi. You have rhombi of this kind. Sorry. And uh, this kind and this kind. Okay, you can cover this with rhombi. And if you do this, I really should have prepared the picture. You, you can see this as a tiling in two dimension, but you can also see it as a set of boxes in three dimension. Uh, sorry, I, I will prepare a, a picture for tomorrow. <laughs> uh, no, I have a picture. I have a picture. Yes, well, on the left, what you see is, a, is a, a tiling. You can see this as a tiling with a rhombi of the triangular lattice, or if you prefer, you can see it as a set of box in the corner of some rooms. And uh, when you increase the number of box, you see that this stepped function becomes, uh, uh, is made of uh, boxes which are tinier and tinier and, and they create, defines a stepped surface, which is uh, what becomes a limit shape in the scaling limit. So in the case of the domino tiling of Fatsek diamond, to which we stick for a reason which will appear clear later on, um, the definition of the eight function is slightly less intuitive, but it can be done. As follow. So you define some function H, which associate to each plaquette of the lattice in your domino tiling picture. Or in a function which is uh, integer valued. OK. 
Okay. So uh, the rule is as follow. We let us define lattice derivative. And similarly in the y direction. And uh, the rule is as follow. Uh, you fix some value at some reference points because it's an eight function as usual you have to define a zero. So you define for instance that h at the origin is zero. This is a choice you fix the origin somewhere in the lattice. And then you put your, you consider your dimer, given dimer configuration. And uh, each time you move from a plaquette to the next one, without crossing a dimer, you vary the height function by one step, by one unity, according to the following rule. When you cross an edge in order to go from one plaquette to the other one, since your uh, system is bipartite, you will always cross an edge and you will, which will have one white and one black vertex. So you consider, for instance, the position of your white vertex. It is, if it is on the right, you put a minus one. And if your white vertex is on the left, you put a plus one. Let us make an example. So, well, we suppose we have some, uh, some dimer uh, configuration. Uh, so, sorry, right? sorry, excuse me. There's yes. a question. Yeah, it's all minus ones. Sorry, uh, uh, yes. The update, the update is, oh, okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for <laughs> it was an update. Thank you. <laughs> so let us suppose uh, we have some given configuration, and here we have some uh, we have chosen our, our refer reference point on this or a plaquette at the origin at this one. Then uh, we took so this is a black vertex. These are all a black vertex. I will leave the white vertex untouched. So here, the height eight function is zero. Then I go to the right, one step to the right. My white vertex is on the right when I move in this direction. And so I have to apply the rule minus one. If I move from here to here, the white vertex is again on the right. So I will have minus two. If I go here, I will have minus one because now my white vertex is here. I am going this way, so it is on the left. And then you go on. So from here to here, it's still on the left. So you have to increase by one, it is zero. Here it is plus one. And here again, it's, it has come to the right, so it is zero. So what you see is that uh, uh, you, you have made a loop and uh, you have come back to the same value of the height function. So this is a well-defined rule. The other thing is that if you cross a dimer, you get a plus of minus three. Instead of getting minus one and plus one, you can apply the same rule across the vertex with, minus, with plus three and minus three, according to the position of the white vertex on the right or the left. Um, where well, this is just a consistency rule, so there is not much to say, but what you can verify in this way is that your height function satisfy this condition which is a kind of Lifshitz condition you know the derivative the lattice derivative of your function is limited to be one so in the case, uh, let us show you a what uh, what happens when you do. You consider this for the 
domino timings of the rectangle, what you see is that for a typical configuration, the rate function, if you choose some zero in some corner, then becomes, uh, tend to fluctuate to stay around zero all over the rectangle. Instead, if you consider a, a NATSEC diamond, the rate function is modified is uh, of this kind. It is of this kind because uh, while on, when you are on the rectangle, essentially, here you have three boundaries. And so you have no constraint and there is no reason that uh, your right function should rise. Uh, this would be break some symmetry between going up and down, for instance. So apart from the, you imagine that the eight function will stay constant. Instead, in the case of the Atec diamond, it is easy to verify that your boundary condition Sorry, we, we can't see the blackboard. Ah, oh, sorry. So in case of the rectangle, uh, you have no constraint uh, on, still, on the boundary? Still no blackboard. <laughs> Thank you again, sorry. This. Uh, once again, yes, on, in case of the rectangle, you have no condition on the rate function on the boundary, so it will fluctuate around zero, around a constant value, while you can see that uh, in the case of the Aztec diamond, you are constraining the rate function in a non-trivial way, for instance, uh, to be one, two, three, something like this along the boundary. It's not exactly this, probably, it depends on the rule you choose. But uh, coming back to the previous, to the last transparencies, What you see, the result is the following, that you have a, your right function in the limit will have some region which can fluctuate, which is disordered, which is the central region. And when you project it on the plane, this will give you the circular region we have seen in previous transparencies. And then you have four region in the four corners of the lattice, four region where the right function is linear. It would, if you think of some bubble, or soap bubble or some membrane with some boundary condition, the membrane will always accommodate to find some equilibrium uh, position, which will be usually smooth. Here's the problem is that we have this Lipschitz condition. And uh, you uh, even if you, the equation could be very simple, something like a Laplacian, then you have uh, to impose this additional constraint, which it's really hard. I mean, when uh, the constraint is not operating, is not saturated, then of course you are in a standard situation and you will have what you have also on the rectangle, a disordered uh, uh, phase. But as soon as uh, the constraint is saturated, then you, you have no room and uh, the rules of a simple linear equation like uh, Laplace does not hold anymore and you have to accommodate the, the free energy of your membrane in such a way uh, to keep everything. And this is uh, what makes, uh, from the mathematical point of view, makes difficult the solution of such kind of problem. Excuse me, okay. maybe I have a question. And uh, well, uh, as you have seen, so what... what... Uh, there's a question. Yes, please. Yeah, the picture that we've just seen is, uh, of course, a discretized version, but I guess that uh, you can write uh, an update equation and then take the scaling limit, right? This is, uh, yes. And uh, this, this, the non-smoothness, uh, so non-analyticity of this eight function uh, is maintained in the scaling limit or uh, it goes away? Yes, yes. The, uh, the function is continuous. The first derivative can be continuous, but uh, of course, uh, uh, you have not full analysis of the function in the scaling limit. You have these facets where all derivatives are, are zeros, except the first one. And then you have the disordered region, which has uh, non zero, which is non trivial, and so. Okay. So actually, one could uh, write some some uh, 
here I can could write some effective action for this eight function. And uh, it appears, well, uh, we can write even equal. It is, this normalization can take any value. Actually, this is kind of incorrect with my normalization, but uh, it's not important. Modulo and overall constant, constant in the scaling limit, what you get when the constraint is not operating is an action of this kind. For instance, on the rectangle, which we all recognize. And uh, since we are in two dimensions, this is actually the conformal the conformal boson of conformal field theory. And a uh, mathematician calls this uh, Gaussian free field. And um, actually, uh, it appears that this, uh, you can always consider this boson as uh, the union of two fermions and the two fermions are the one which actually are associated to the dimers. Sorry, can I ask something here? So this- yes? uh, the H that you write now, is it the same as before or is it, or have you removed some like classical part? Well, yes, one should remove, you're right. One should remove some classical part. Well, of course, if, when you are in, in the rectangle, well, one part is a constant, so you can even ignore it because it does not appear in the DX. But uh, yes, you should, uh, it is a kind of, of uh, first correction with respect to this is considering the fluctuation. So actually, if you write all the time, you will have a, a term which is a limit shape, which is uh, trivial in some cases. And then you have uh, this first effective action. Okay, thanks. Yes. And uh, well, uh, actually you can, uh, if you, from this, you can consider the dimer-dimer uh, correlation function. That is the probability of observing uh, Two, two dimers at some distance r in two given uh, in two given configuration in two, a configuration a given configuration for two given dimers which are at distance r and if r is uh, in the usual conditions that it should be much larger than the lattice spacing but so that this effective description is correct is uh, satisfying but much smaller than the size of the region of the lattice so that finite size effects are not operating, then you can use conformal field theory and uh, I just sketch the result. And the result is as this correlation function goes like, if I am correct, yes, this is okay. So summarizing the determination of the limit shape, is in principle easy when you have a easy boundary condition, when the constraint is not satisfied, but become, it can become a very difficult task as soon as the constraint operates. Then what are other questions you can ask? You can ask, coming back to the Arctic Circle, You know, here we have a lot of uh, vertical dominoes, which are in the frozen region. And then if you consider the diagonal here, and you consider the occurrence for, of uh, the first domino, which is not in the frozen region, which is, uh, can be, for, for instance, a, an horizontal domino. And you consider the position of this domino with respect to the Arctic circle, when you are you have not done the limit, you are in the larger limit and you are considering correction, fluctuation around this limit. So you are considering what is the fluctuation of this first uh, domino, which is not in the brick wall pattern. And you want to look at the fluctuation when you consider different sampling and you look at this distribution and you will see that it is described for any given sample, the position of this domino with respect to the position 
the limiting position given by the theory by the Arctic Circle is just given by some constant, by some one, n to the one third. You must remember that this is pro are proportional to n at this stage. I am not rescaled. Times some random variable chi. Chi is a random variable such that its integrated uh, probabilities is given by the so-called Tracy Widom distribution. I will uh, explain what is this Tracy Widom. So this is uh, uh, the integrated probability. If you take the derivative of this, we, you will have some density probability, which will be something like uh, a Gaussian. I will show you, but it's different from a Gaussian. And uh, in general, it's better. I mean, uh, the Tracy Widom distribution is rather expressed in terms of this function, which is related to Panlose, has no explicit form. It is related to some solution of some Panlose equation. Uh, but we can plot this, uh, the derivative of this F2. Let us plot it. So this is F2 prime. I will explain what is the two, et cetera, et cetera. This is a Tracy Widom function associated to the Gaussian unitary ensemble of random matrix model. Um, so, it is a function which is made more or less here in this way. It is, it is asymmetric. This tail is fatter. The right tail is fatter than the left tail. Uh, you can see that here you have a, a decay, if this is variable S, a decay which goes to like e to the minus S cube, while here it goes only R here to the minus S to the three half. And uh, why it's important, you know, it looks like just a very complicated way of saying, well, more or less you will have fluctuation, it will be something like a Gauss and blah, blah, blah. Well, it is very important because it is universal. It is just like the Gaussian, universal. It appears in a very wide variety of contexts, but it is different from the Gaussian. So that's why it's so important because it is one of the very few distribution which, uh, uh, by the way, has been discovered only 26 years ago. It is one of the very few uh, universal distribution. What do you mean by universal? For instance, why the Gaussian is universal? So Gaussian is universal because whatever probability distribution you consider, as soon as you have uh, some uh, uh, given uh, finite um, variance, and then you consider the sum of a lot of these random variables with some whatever distribution uh, which satisfies uh, some of these conditions, and you will always obtain for the sum variable, you will obtain a Gaussian. In this sense, Gaussian is universal. And here you have something similar. If you consider random matrix model, if you consider the edge behavior of some uh, electron gas, if you consider domino tidings, you will always have this Tracy Widom distribution. It appears actually that it is uh, closely related to free fermions. And it's not clear if one should go away, should go beyond free fermion. It's not clear if this kind of universal behavior would, would really survive. Ah, it's also observed in Carter Parisi Zhang universality class. Of course, all these topics are somewhat related. Uh, uh, I'm so sorry. On, on on the blackboard, is it X sample minus X theory? Ah, sorry, yes, X theory. So X sample is the position of the first domino which is uh, breaking the, from the right. You are going from the right on the diagonal. The first domino which is out of the brick wall pattern that you have on the right side, you will have some coordinate and you call it X. Then you consider X theory is just the position that would be given by the Arctic Circle. It is the intersection between the Arctic Circle and, and, um, and the diagonal, okay? 
So you can compute okay. it. some okay. square root of two something. Okay, thanks. I also have a question. Yes. Uh, so this distribution does not expect the parity with respect to S. So no, but plus uh, S and minus S. Yes. 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 We, which correspond to the fact that uh, uh, when you go from disorder to order, you have no symmetry between the two sides. Also, when you consider, for instance, in random matrix theory, um, the probability of eigen the probability density of eigenvalues on one side it is non-zero, on the other side it is zero, and at the transition, the fluctuation of the smallest or larger eigenvalue are exactly governed by this distribution. What is this two? This two is because is related to for those who have some notion of random matrix theory, you can consider random matrix theory with some index beta, which is one to four. According, if you are considering some Gaussian orthogonal unitary or symplectic ensemble, and so you will have three distribution by Tracy Widom, which are one F1, F2, and F4, which are slightly different but qualitatively similar. But sorry, do you find? So, sorry, sorry I, I, I didn't understand uh, that. So uh, why do you say this now? Do you find F1 and F4 also in this problem? No. Uh, here, no, no. Is there are some problem where you can find a F1 and F4? F1 maybe. Uh, I think it was observed at F1. Not in a problem of tiling, but in other of these problems of uh, related between physics and combinatorics. Okay. Thank you. But uh, yes, just to say it's a relation with random matrix models. Sorry, but can you model, can you get this distribution by some sort of random walk where going in one direction or the other is different? Yes, uh, well, it's not really this. You can model this problem as a series of random work. Mm. Uh -huh. Let us. Uh, let us consider our Atsec diamond. Actually, there is a mapping. Here you have these dominoes. But you can uh, model, uh, associate to the, for instance, to these dominoes, a pass in this way to the domino on the left. I remember that the parities are both vertical, but domino on the left and on the right have different parity. So the dominoes on the right have a different parity with respect to the underlying white and black lattice. And you can associate a step in this way. And then for the horizontal one, for one, according to the parity, you associate this or nothing. Okay, and then you will have a series of paths here. And of course, there is a hidden in the geometry, the packs are not interacting. This is a way to, to given on Wikipedia to prove the formula I, show, I gave them before. But uh, uh, the packs cannot compress much uh, below. While well, they can, uh, I mean, these packs can oscillate to the right freely, while it cannot oscillate to the, sorry, can fluctuate in the up direction freely, while it cannot fluctuate too much in the low direction because it cannot cross the other path. This is a symmetry between inside and outside, which is very similar. Actually, you can prove rigorously that this intersection of this path with this diagonal, uh, you can compute and you, what you see is a random matrix model on discrete. Okay. It's not a random matrix model, it is a log gas. A log gas because the again value are considered to be discrete. So, okay, let us... Uh, Something else? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. No. No. It's so. Good. So it's a problem of of uh, free fermions. Also, it's a free theory, but because of this uh, boundary condition, it becomes uh, non-trivial. Yes. Uh, quite remarkable. Yes. Oh, rather remarkable. Yes. But a random matrix model also can be viewed as few free fermions. Of course, uh, there is no problem of boundary condition, but there is uh, still a lot of non-trivial things. Yes, yes, the, 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 the domain, the domain in which the random work takes place is non-trivial, yes, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, 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 is it uh, topologically non-trivial as well, or no? Sorry, say it again. Is it topologically non-trivial as well? You, uh, what you mean? Uh, like, uh, does it have any uh, gene holes on 
or if you if you kind of map it to a manifold, or uh, or it doesn't that doesn't make sense. Sorry, but I, I didn't understand the question. The question oh, is: uh, is it is it uh, is it topologically non-trivial? No. Why? Uh, in which? What is topology? Could be topologically non-trivial. I mean, what are you speaking about? It's like on, on, on like uh, the anomalous Hall effect, for example. That's topologically not trivial, and uh, no, it's free. No, 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 uh, no, 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 nothing to do with uh, this. This is much simpler. That's why it's a nice. I, I like this problem because it is simply formulated, much simpler than the quantum Hall effect. I must say. <laughs> okay. So. So what to say? Yes. So what we have learned, we have the Zeg diamond, uh, we have these frozen boundaries, which cannot even be described by quantum field theory, by field theory, because uh, it's not clear what is the field. It, it looks like the boundary condition creates a boundary condition here in something, but it's not even in this way. Then you have a disordered region. The disordered region has been proven rigorously to fluctuate, with fluctuation governed by the Gaussian free fields. Then what you have, you can consider uh, the fluctuation of the Arctic curve, and these are governed by random matrix models uh, or log gas or tracy widom distribution, whatever you like. It is the same, a different name for the same thing. And finally, finally, one can ask what is the limit shape? And you can compute the limit shape as well, and it has been done. And uh, uh, well, I, in the picture I've shown, it was numeric. So in the approximation, in the limit, you can imagine what will be the limit shape. So. Then the question is, okay, we know everything about the Aztec diamond, but can we go farther? So, of course, some, some progress has been done huh? uh, in considering other lattice, other timing. So this, as I told you, is, uh, you can see this as a rhombi timings of, a triangular lattice, or if you prefer, you can consider the dual lattice, so you will consider dimers on the honeycomb lattice. If you think a little bit, you, you really can draw them. And again, you can see the limit shape, which is given here. You can study the fluctuation, the fluctuation of the boundary and the fluctuation in the disordered region. And uh, what I have said before still holds. Then you can consider even more complicated Tilings and moreover, more complicated regions. For instance, if you take regions which are not anymore uh, an hexagon, but uh, a concave region, you will have some non-trivial Arctic curve with cusps. Then you can ask, what is the behavior in the cusps? And the behavior appears to be a Piercy process, which is a kind of, uh, you know, why do you get Airy process or Tracy Widom because you, you are making some kind of uh, asymptotic expansion, some saddle point expansion. But what happens? The first derivative is zero because you are in saddle point, but the, the second derivative appears to be zero as well. And you have to consider the third derivative, which is the one which rule, rules your problems. And this is what this is exactly when you have Airy and when you have, for instance, Tracy Widom. If you consider the curve, you see that the third derivative vanishes as well, and you have to consider the fourth derivative, the fourth order uh, term, and this gives you a different process and a different universality class. Yes, I, I have been asked to write the names <laughs> explicitly, which is useful because you can, for instance, look for them in the net. So every function, every function is kind of ubiquitous in this kind of discussion. I will not explain a lot about this, nothing about this, but uh, you should know it from, uh, from your undergraduate course. Okay, so actually all this has been, uh, all this kind of lattice, all this kind of domains on these various lattice and all this situation and fluctuation and uh, universal behavior have been more or less completely understood in the last uh, 15 years. Uh, a great contribution has been done by Okunkov, Kenyon, and Sheffield, and also Reshetikin, I would say. 
and uh, everything is quite under control. But uh, as I have already told you many times, this is just free fermion. You can consider this in many ways, for instance, also as a non intersecting lattice pass or all loose dimer and blah, blah, blah. And they are all free fermions. And one would ask, but what happens if we add some interaction? Uh, what happens? I mean, does the universality hold? Are we able to compute something? So this is the kind of a uh, little bit the frontiers on this topic at the current time. So how can you add uh, an interaction? Well, uh, uh, of course you can add many interaction, but uh, some are kind of trivial. Uh, most of interaction, you, you can add some uh, Boltzmann weight, non-trivial Boltzmann weight. Now Boltzmann weight is one for every couple of dimers. Let us introduce some short range interaction by assigning to neighboring dimer in a given uh, configuration a non-trivial Boltzmann weight. It appears that most of uh, the non-trivial configuration are equivalent to uh, the Boltzmann, Boltzmann weight associated to most of configuration can be viewed as an external field and it is not uh, modifying anything qualitatively. The only non-trivial interaction which can be added is the one of assigning a weight, a Boltzmann weight, e to the delta, delta when you have two, two neighboring dominoes which are parallels. If you do in this way, uh, the model is in general non-integrable. It has been studied, for instance, by Toninelli, but it is uh, non-integrable. If you want an integrable model, and why would you like an integrable model to work out exact results? We are interested in exact results, and it is clear that even here, how can you build some perturbative, uh, pro uh, approximate perturbative uh, um, approach to study this kind of stuff. You need exact results. So what we want is a, an exact model. And it appears that if we give this weight e to the del delta, not, not to all, not to all uh, uh, parallel pairs of domino, but only to the one which stay on a given sub lattice with the gray dots, uh, with the gray dots, uh, then what you have uh, is an exact mapping to an integral model, which is the six vertex model. This correspondence was shown by Cooperberg in 96 and has been very fruitful both for mathematicians and for physicists. Okay, so it is probably a good time to stop here, right? Yes, of course, we have time for questions, but I would stop here. Summarizing. Oh, well, summarizing. Well, one thing I have not done is that actually the non-integrable version, when you assign this e to the delta, the non-integrable version, when you assign this weight e to the delta to this kind of domino configuration, has been turned also uh, numerically and also in part analytically but not for limit shape, for other kind of question by Pasquier and collaborators. Jacobsen, I think. And uh, yes, summarizing. So what we have, uh, we have that, uh, uh, we have a clear picture of what happened for the free phenomenon case. We saw this domino or uh, tilings or dimer models, but we would like to go beyond this, introduce an interaction and the natural interaction. I mean, the one which look promising for this kind of study from an exact point of view is the one which give us, which translate, which move the Daimler model to the six vertex model of statistical mechanics, which will be the subject of the remaining lectures. So time for question. Okay, are there questions? Uh, maybe I, I just want to say that uh, I tried to look at uh, uh, the link that you put in the program uh, where there should be a link to an article called the canyon on dimers but it doesn't work at least for me it says that uh, I don't have permissions ah, uh, you can look at it uh, it could be that uh, I was in the department that time oh sorry 
I will I will adjust this in the afternoon. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there is another copy somewhere, so don't worry. Yes. Okay, it's just to understand if I understood clearly. Uh, so the, the interaction that you described that is by assigning that weight to the parallel dimers, is it then the only integrable uh, um, interaction that you can add, that is not described just by an external field? Uh, yes, it is only one. And moreover, you have to do it with the caveat that I told only on on half, half yes. of the sub, uh, on one sublattice on the two. Yes, it is the only one I know which is non trivial. Of course, you can add an external field, but it is free family and external field remains free if the external field is constant, yes. especially. And uh, what about fluctuations with these interactions? Are they still Tracy Weedham or the fluctuations I, with the, of the boundary? You mean yes, of the, of the boundary? Curve, right? Yes, uh, I will tell this tomorrow. <laughs> Okay. But uh, it's it's uh, actually it's uh, not known, but there is some numerics by Tracy by Herbert Spohn. Okay, thank you. Which uh, says it looks like yes. Thanks. Okay. Other questions. Uh, well, I, I can ask a question maybe. So, um, uh, yeah, so you stressed that you're looking for a integrable, for a, an integrable interacting model, but uh, uh, so, and you said that this is because you want is something solvable, uh, which is uh, yeah. fine. But would you expect the, the phenomenology to change if you had uh, an interacting non-integrable non uh, interacting uh, dimer model, uh, would you expect still to have a limit shape uh, or, or do you think it changes completely? I mean, in other words, does, does this have to do with integrability or No, or I, don't think so. I don't think it has to do with integrability. Well, some of the results probably yes, but uh, the qualitative picture of this phase separation, in my opinion, has nothing to do with integrability, but uh, it's not easy to, I think numerical simulation have been done uh, for non-integrable, maybe even by Pasquier, uh, Pasquier, Jacob, Seniclef, et cetera. But, uh, well, they were not interested in the phase separation actually, but uh, the phenomenology was not uh, drastically changing. Of course, you have a different conformal field theory, different universality class, but. But uh, I don't know. Okay, mm -hmm. I don't know. But I expect that uh, it will not change much. Mm -hmm. Do you have an opinion on this? Who me? Yes. Yes, I agree. I, I could think the phenomenology wouldn't would not change. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Probably. Yes. Probably. Um, Sorry. Okay. Can I, other. Sure. Can I ask a very vague question? So. In terms of, you know, the general features that lead to this sort of behavior, you know, general models, are there kind of uh, general features that seem to lead to it? And do they always seem to lead to it? Or, you know, are there cases where you might expect that there's an Arctic circle and it doesn't appear for some reason? Um, sorry, but I didn't understand the question because the audio is not good here. Maybe Jérôme can repeat. I, I, actually, I didn't uh, understand everything either. Can you just uh, repeat the question uh, question uh, a little bit uh, sure, so uh, s slowly? Yeah. I mean, if you want to extract the most general features uh, that you know what enables uh, this sort of behavior to occur, mm -hmm. uh, you know, is it generally thought that under these conditions, generically, you see this sort of behavior, or are there kind of known pathological cases where you might expect that it shows up, but for some reason it doesn't, you know, is it kind of universal or not clear whether this is the case? Uh, but what are the conditions? Uh... Well, so I mean here, you know, you have a, a boundary condition and then the, the kind of properties of the system mean that, you know, you have some quite strong constraints on where things can go. So, you know, in general, what, is there any idea of what sort of uh, conditions like that are necessary 
Yes. Uh, uh, okay. So, uh, okay. So, did you did you understand the question? No. No. Okay. So the question is, uh, if I understand correctly, it's uh, what are the necessary conditions for this to occur? And uh, given these conditions, uh, how how universal is this uh, is this expected to be? Well, as uh, you mean to observe, for instance, phase separation and all that stuff. Yes, yes. Yes. Well, if you choose some, you know, you have this description in terms of the height function. If on the boundary you put some height function which saturates the constraints, you expect that near the boundary uh, the constraint will still be saturated. And so uh, you will have uh, this non trivial limit shapes. Uh, if you choose yeah. boundary condition which uh, do not saturate the constraints, then no problem. Uh, the bulk will not uh, suffer any constraint and you will have a standard situation just like in the rectangle. But as soon as the boundary you impose that the height function is increasing linearly, so it is saturating the Lipschitz constraint, then you are done. You will get something. Excuse me, maybe uh, are you saying that uh, Usually in physics, especially, we use uh, two simple types of boundary conditions, either um, periodic or fixed at the ends. So, so this seems to be a behavior that emerges because of you are imposing, uh, let's say, different boundary conditions. So do you expect that uh, uh, this will cause like the same uh, phenomena if we do this in standard calculations that we have done uh, in physics if we impose uh, different boundary conditions because often we say that boundary conditions don't matter but uh, well uh, very good. when, uh, when uh, the interaction are such that uh, the, the uh, sorry when I, I have to answer to the question, I go near to the speaker. So that's why I get out of uh, the blackboard. Yes, as you, you know, the assumption about uh, uh, the assumption under which you can neglect boundary conditions. So uh, yeah, it, you break this I, assumption. And here, why do you break this assumption? I usually yeah, do this when... This. If here, in the domino tiling, if you move one domino in one position, you have these constraints of no overlap, no holes, immediately, you have to, to change the position of nearby dominoes all over the lattice. So you have a kind of interaction which propagates everywhere. And, and because this is because the correlations are longer, you are critical in some sense. So at the critical point, I expect boundary conditions uh, to matter. But... Uh, no, no. Uh, for instance, uh, we shall see in the six detect model, you can consider the antiferroelectric phase. And uh, the, you see this uh, limit shape phenomena under fixed boundary condition. Of course, with periodic, you will see nothing, periodic or free. But with fixed, with this non-trivial height function, then you will see it. And uh, if you do the Miltonian limit of this, I will say you more. If you do the Miltonian limit of this, you will obtain what is uh, the light cone effect in the quantum quench when you start from some domain wall initial state. Domain wall initial state is that you have your spin chain with all spins up on the right and spin down on the left, and then you make XXZ Hamiltonian evolution. And what you see is some light cone effect, and the light cone effect can be viewed as a remnant of the Hamiltonian, under the Hamiltonian limit, as a remnant of the Arctic circle. But uh, maybe I am saying too much. <laughs> so I. Sorry, maybe I can make a comment, Philippe. Yes, about please. This. Yeah. So basically, the, the important point is also that uh, when you uh, think at this model in terms of fermions, uh, the boundary condition they select uh, uh, basically only in one state in the Hilbert space. So there is a huge constraint because there is a uh, essentially particle number conservation. And, and if you impose a boundary condition such that uh, basically for each uh, side you have one fermion, then there is just one state with that property. You see, so, so it's a huge constraint on the Hilbert space essentially. 
that you are uh, imposing. Uh, no, I, yes, I, uh, I am not able to, re it was not heard very well, but I am not able to repeat because I was not uh, listening, but more or less, uh, it is a point that uh, actually, yes, this boundary condition, if you view, it, view them uh, as initial condition, select one particular state in the Hilbert space, and uh, so this is a huge constraint and moreover you have uh, this particle number conservation. So if you have selected the state with a given number of particles then this have to be conserved and uh, this select a, a very, uh, a relatively tiny part of your real best state in, for the evolution. I think, uh, well, you can correct me Jacopo if I was not. Yeah, the idea was that one. If you have a symmetry like you want, like in the beta and such, you ask which are the state to which uh, have maximum magnetization, there's just one. So yeah. if you start with that state, nothing happened in the dynamics. They're just totally trivial. Yes. Here, something similar happened because of the boundary condition, at least close to the corners. Uh, <clears throat> are there other questions? I don't see any questions in the chat. Ah, what's happening? Sorry, there was some. Okay, I don't see any further questions uh, in the chat, so... Um, there were so, some comments about random matrix theory, but I think you covered that earlier. Um, okay, so well, if, if there are no other questions, then uh, let's, uh, let's uh, stop here for this morning. Okay, so we resume at two o'clock for the lecture by Balash Posgai, and then at, from four to six, there is this gong seminar. So please, uh, Get ready. Thank you to everybody. Uh, thank you, Jerome. So see you later. Bye-bye.